Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today's guest spent time in his youth working in rodeos as well as hunting and fishing. He's a celebrated author with books on leadership and marksmanship, a decorated warrior serving 21 years in the U.S. Army with over 15 years in the Elite Special Forces Operations Detachment, Delta Force. With tours in Bosnia, Desert Storm, Somalia, and five tours in Iraq, he was there at the Battle of Mogadishu made famous by the movie Black Hawk Down. He's an entrepreneur and founder of Viking Tactics, which provides training, gear, and accessories, and he's a custom knife maker, which he uses to help raise funds for the nonprofit Stay in the Fight Foundation. Welcome to the Silver Corp Podcast, retired Sergeant Major, Kyle Lamb. Man, I think we're done right there. You said it all. <laughs> that is the best <laughs> intro I think I've ever had. Oh Thank my you. God. You, you did not make my job easy because I am only scratching the surface of the information that's publicly available out there. So I know there's a heck of a lot more to Kyle Lamb than what I put in there. That was, uh, that was not easy. Have you always had this eclectic background or is that something you kind of grew into? I've always been a weirdo. So it, <laughs> you know, I was the guy that was at school. I always had a 22 or a shotgun in my car mm-hmm. uh, and I drove a car. I didn't have a truck. I had a 73 Buick Centurion and, Beauty. Uh, and I would, yeah. And I would go out and hunt or fish or whatever before or after school and then I rodeoed and then I played sports. So I played football and ran track, um, played baseball and student council president. And I, I won the spelling bee one year. I trained for several <laughs> years so I could beat Carrie Canigator in the spelling bee. It's just like, I don't have a very good attention span. And, uh, because of that, I just, I do a, do- a lot of different things. And, and that, you know, that's something we were talking about before we got going, you know, the ADHD mm-hmm. deal. You said you were diagnosed. I was not diagnosed, but I'm practicing, I think, because <laughs> I do have a little bit of a difficulty focusing on one thing for an, a, an, a, a super long amount of time. So like, if I'm going to write mm. a book, if I set a goal that I'm going to write a book, I don't really have an issue with that because I'm going to write the book. Now, right. I may take a couple of little uh, beaver runs <laughs> from, uh, on the way to get into that, that actual successful product in the end, or maybe not successful, but completed project in the end. But, sure. uh, I guess, you know, what I, what I say to that is if you have kids that are like us, don't punish them, you mm. know, work, work for their, and I, and my, like my grandson, he, you know, he's never been diagnosed with it either, but he's a busy dude. Like he's always mm. got stuff going on. So what do we do? We take him for a walk. We take him out in the woods. He's been shooting. This year he killed his first deer. He's nine years old. He killed his first deer with wow. an AR on our Good property. Um, we're down in the lower 48, so we can hunt with ARs down here. Mm. And he uh, he was just, you know, he's super stoked. He's been shooting for years and years, getting ready to go on that hunt. And I guess the moral of that story is if we just, if we didn't get him outside and keep him busy, he gets in trouble. Because he's going to get, he's, Yeah, he's going to do, and I'm the same way. And I imagine you've been in trouble a bit in your life too. Um, (laughs) Uh, Got kicked out of a few different schools and for discipline and really not even discipline type problems. It was my interests exceeded what the school's capabilities were. So I like chemistry and chemistry meant disappearing or invisible ink and explosives. Well, schools didn't really like that, right? And I liked, uh, I learned how to pick locks in grade four because I like puzzles, right? And well, that doesn't really fit. So, uh. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And the medication thing. So when I was in grade three, about halfway through grade three, my family's like, we're done. You're going. We've got these pamphlets. There's a uh, a boarding school that can take kids free of charge. I think it was a, a military boarding school. 
see ya. Right. And I looked at that and at grade three, I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. That sounds scary. In hindsight, it probably would have been one of the best things I could have ever done because it's a different structure, but they ended up taking me to a doctor, got diagnosed and he actually put me on the highest dosage of Ritalin on an experimental run in the province. I can only prescribe so much and I have to take eight pills in the morning and another five in the afternoon and, uh, up until grade seven, into grade seven, I'm like, I'm not going to go into high school with these. Took myself off cold to turkey. So I agree with you. Don't medicate them. There are ways that we can deal with them. Getting outside for me was massive. Yeah. And you know, and the other thing too is, so speaking of being outdoors, eat what's outdoors. Mm. What do we have outdoors? We have fruits and vegetables and we have meat. And I don't care mm. if it's fish or beef, or moose, or elk, or white-tailed deer, or turkey. I don't care if it's what color of vegetable you eat, but eat it. And I think if we do that, like my grandson one day, we one of our little special times, I've got a grandson and a granddaughter. And we one of our special things together is we like to eat popsicles. And we'll go grab a popsicle in the summer, and we'll sit out on the porch and eat this popsicle. So they get to go and choose the popsicle they want out of the freezer and we head out there and grandpa has a popsicle with him. And it's just, it, it, it's just like a special time, you know, mm-hmm. and, and really any time with your grandkids is a special time, but that's especially a special deal. So one day I was grabbing popsicles and I really hadn't thought about it. And I grabbed a red one and like a pineapple one or something. And I, I, I'm like, which one do you want? And my grandson looks at me and goes, grandpa, I can't eat red because it makes me crazy. And it's true. The the red, something to do with the red dye would make him like insane for just, you know, for an hour, but he'd get in trouble because of it. Well, that was our fault. That's not his fault. Don't feed Mm -hmm. him a stupid red popsicle. Give him one that's white or green or purple or any other color. He was fine. So I think, you know, keeping those kids exercised to, to work off a lot of that, that excessive, energy they have. I know for me, it's that way. My wife every morning makes me go work out because she knows <laughs> that if I don't work out, I'm going to be a complete dirt bag. So mm-hmm. make me go for a three to five mile walk, you know, whatever it is that we're going to do, but get out and get moving. And then of course, you know, if you get outside, you're going to feel better in the first place there. Um, I was going to tell you, you, you a couple of stories about growing up. Um, One of them happened when my mom died. So this was not that many years ago. She was like 93 or something when she passed away. Mm -hmm. So go to my mom's funeral. Now, now you got to put this all in perspective. I'm in South Dakota at my mom's funeral. That's a significant emotional event for Mm -hmm. a dude to have their mom die. Whether, Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't care what you think about your mom. You only have one mom. Mm -hmm. That's your mom. And my mom was a character. She was a, she was a character born in like 1925. My dad was born in 1911. You know, she went through the dirty thirties. She, she could, she was, I don't know how you would call it thrifty. (laughs) Some people call her tight or whatever, but she could, you know, she was, that's how she was. So I go to the funeral and after the funeral, my, my niece is there and my niece is a year older than me. And she's a school teacher and she's standing over there with this other lady. And as soon as I see her and I, I, this isn't serious, but you know, when I saw her, my trigger finger started to twitch and, uh, (laughs) I'm like, Oh yeah. So this lady walks up and she goes, and this lady's just grumpy. She goes, do you remember me? Mm. And I go, yes, ma'am. I do remember you. She's like, Oh, you do remember me. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm thinking, my son needs to meet this lady. This is one of my school teachers and I want him to meet uh, this lady's like an evil beast woman, you know? Yeah. So I said, Hey Lucas, come over here. I want you to meet one of my old school teachers. I go, Mrs. Waldo, this is my son, Lucas. And she's like, did your dad ever tell you what he did to me? And he's like, <laughs> no. And he goes, well, you know what he said to me one day? He got in trouble and he called me a bitch. And I was like, all right, well, I'm at my mom's funeral. I appreciate you uh, telling this great story here, but 
I don't need to hang around any longer. So I was like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, good seeing you. And I walked away. So later on, we get in the car to leave. And my son, he's grown. He's not a little kid. He mm. uh, got in the car. My wife didn't know this had happened. I said, Lucas, sorry about that. That was kind of weird. He goes, Dad, I only met her for like two minutes, and I think you nailed it. <laughs> and it's like, this lady has been living, I've been living in her head. Like, I've been sitting mm -hmm. on a lawn chair, smoking a stogie in her head for 30 yes. years. Oh, that's and funny. I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. Like, I had a great influence on this lady, obviously. From, no from, kidding. From, from that many years ago. And then one other quick story. I got a call from my old English teacher. I didn't get a call, but I got a, an email through our website. And it said, I had a guy that went in my, he was in my English classes and speech classes. And he acts a lot like you do. And his name was Kyle Lamb. Hmm. And I was like, Mr. Kinder, yeah, it's, this guy was a great teacher. He was an awesome teacher. He would, we had a kid in our class that really didn't talk to anybody. We had a very large class for South Dakota. There was 20 kids in my graduating class. My wife was from a school about 50 miles away in Castlewood, South Dakota, and she had 12. But mm. uh, this kid, he was a nice kid, but he rode a motorcycle. He wasn't particularly well-kept. And... Mm. The teacher, Mr. Kinder, says, uh, what are you going to talk about? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I don't have a subject. I don't know what to talk about. And he goes, well, what do you really like to do? Well, I like to ride my motorcycle. And he had his dirt bike. And he goes, I want to do a class on your motorcycle. And he goes, well, like, what do I do? And he goes, well, what, do you, what do you maintenance do you do on your motorcycle? Well, I, I change the oil. Goes, okay, change the oil. Can you teach us how to change the oil? And he goes, yeah, but how am I going to do that? And he goes, you're going to bring your motorcycle in the school mm -hmm. in the classroom and you're going to teach us how to change the oil mm -hmm. and this kid's like whoa no kidding there you go there's a teacher that that teacher is a five-star teacher because now he's taken a kid and he's taken his interests and he's shown him that your interests are just as good as anybody else's interest they don't have to be the same mm -hmm. you know i'm going to give a speech on guns or i'm going to give a speech on fishing or hunting or whatever he's going to give a speech on how to change the oil in a motorcycle and i saw that kid like dynamically change right there in front of our eyes and wow. so mr kinder i said oh mr kinder I, you know i wrote a i wrote a couple books can i send you one sure that'd be great so i sent him a book and two months later i hadn't heard from him and i i emailed him and i said so you got the book what do you think and he goes it's fine and I'm like, he's still an English teacher. You know, he read it like an English teacher, I'm sure. But uh -huh. it, he's he's one of those teachers that I really looked up to. And I think that inspired me as an instructor that I want to be like Mr. Kinder and and be able to come across to people like that and focus on what their interests are and making them better. Because as an instructor, it ain't about you. It's about your student. And if your student yes. doesn't get any better at the end of the day, it's your fault. It's not their fault. 100%. 100%. Yeah, so, we just wrapped up a, uh, a course. We have a new batch of hunter education instructors coming through the province. So they asked if I could teach them a basic method of instruction and classroom management, dealing with difficult students. And, you know, as I'm in there, I'm thinking about it. I almost failed grade seven. The teacher only passed me because I was such a pain in the ass that they didn't want to see me there again. <laughs> I was, I think five different high schools. And she told me that straight up to my face. She's like, I think high school will do you good. I don't want to see you again. You should have failed, but you're going on. Uh, five yeah. different high schools I went to. Like, I'm not a school person. Why is it I'm teaching people how to teach? How did I end up in a profession where I'm running this? And maybe it's because you go through that school of hard knocks and you learn all the ways that don't work for you. I don't know. But well, and, and you know, and we had a, a very robust shop class type mm -hmm. environment too. So, I mean, we had chemistry teacher that was awesome. I, I wasn't a big chemistry guy, but he, you know, when I got to, I guess it's not chemistry, biology or whatever, cutting up frogs, mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, blowing That's up. Right. You know, well, you're not supposed to blow up stuff, but lighting Bunsen burners <laughs> and getting, we'd make stuff blow up. Um, yeah. and then we had our shop class where we learned to do 110, 220. We learned to, I, I already knew how to arc weld, I thought. And then I had this, mm -hmm. this, uh, this guy, Kendall Thompson, who was my instructor, he passed away a couple years ago, but he taught me how to MIG weld. I wish he would have taught me how to TIG weld. He never did, and I don't, maybe we just didn't even have that, but 
now when I MIG weld, every time I MIG weld, I think of him because he's the guy that really showed me how to do that. And now I make mm. knives, so I'm making Damascus and San Mai, and I'm using my my welder to do stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that in America, and I, I suppose in Canada, it's the same way, you know, in some areas, they, they somewhat frown on Votech type schools. Mm -hmm. But where I grew up, that was like, that, that was the place to go. Like, if you want to go learn, truly learn a craft, you went to Votech, you didn't go to college. Now, there's mm -hmm. a lot of kids that went to college and God bless them. They went to college and they're still paying for it. So good for them. Sure. But sure. those other folks that went and became diesel mechanics or welders or plumbers or HVAC people or whatever, well, they've already retired because they went through that. They got, they made a lot of money if they were willing to work hard. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and I joined the army, which was, that's my Votech school. Um, <laughs> and I did that for 21 years when I got out. I mean, I get a paycheck every month because of that. At least I still do now. I don't know if they're going to take that away from us or not, but, uh, <laughs> we'll see. it's, it, 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 I just think that the, the attitude, the, the, what's the guy's name? Um, Mike Rowe. Okay. Uh, the dirty jobs guy. Mike, yeah, yeah. He does a yeah. spectacular job of getting kids involved and in going to to learn something like that. And and when I say Votech, you know, if you can go become a, a nurse's assistant or uh, work as cleaning teeth or, or anything like that, I mean, there's so many great things that you can learn. And when you're done, you have a job versus, mm -hmm. you know, you go get your philosophy degree. And when you're done, you still have to work at Starbucks. Or I guess mm -hmm. up where you're at, you got to work at Tim Hortons or something Tim like Hortons. that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got a couple so, Starbucks kicking around too. Yeah. I'd, <laughs> anyway. I had a buddy do the philosophy thing and goes to university and gets his master's and on and on it goes. I'm like, what the hell are you going to do with this? Well, he ended up working for government. So I guess there's always that, right? But uh, uh, yeah. Philo ethics and government, he started working and I, I just thought that was an oxymoron, but good on him for... Uh, <laughs> for going in there and putting his two bits in. Um, we, had, yeah, we, and, we talked before yeah. this, we said we were going to talk about politi uh, politics, religion, <laughs> and yeah. we, I guess we ought to hit on race while we're at it too, but <laughs> Let's yeah, do politics, all. man, Offend I everyone. was joking with you. Yeah. I was joking with you before we started about, yeah, at least we don't have Trudeau. We've only got a Biden, but it's mm -hmm. pretty, uh, man, it's pretty dire circumstances right now in Canada for you guys. And, and it's, it's crazy that as an American, I can see that like your farmers and how they're struggling and they're getting just abused by your government. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, man, it's, it's sad. The energy thing is what really is upsetting to me because you guys can make, um, natural gas. Oil, My understanding natural is gas. you guys can, well, well the, like the natural gas, though, it's easier for you guys to process it because it's already totally. cold in Canada. That's right. So, yeah, people are trying to say we should be green and do all this. Well, if you want to be green, then you should buy all your natural gas from Canada. Totally. You know what I mean? Totally. So, yeah, I don't I know. They, it's, got the it's, whole, uh, they got the whole green thing backwards. Go get yourself electric vehicles. And actually, I noticed just recently a lot of... Uh, electric vehicle manufacturers are seriously cutting back on their production because the public appetite isn't there. The cost to produce is, uh, so high. And the, the myth of that being green is starting to come to light. The amount of energy required in order to maintain, to create and sustain the electrical vehicle grid is, um, is tremendous, but it sure sounds good from a political standpoint. Oh, you know, carbon tax and, you know, we're going to make the world green. You wouldn't be against the nature, would you? You're not, you're not anti, uh, sustainability, are you? And I think they just framed the whole argument completely wrong. And it's, you're, you're right. It's easier from somebody on the outside to look in from a U.S. citizen to look into Canada and say, what's going on over there? than it is for somebody who's on the inside, who's so indoctrinated and is only hearing half of the information, like our news. If I pull up CBC on Instagram or Meta, I can show it to you. The whole thing's blocked. And who would think that would happen in a place like Canada? But the, the thing that gets me is it's not Biden and it's not Trudeau. 
it's the people that would get behind and vote something like this in and think that yeah. this is a good idea, right? These are just figureheads for a zeitgeist or a, um, yeah. a, a public sentiment that is just absolutely awry and it will swing back, but it's going to have to get bad before it does. Well, they, you know, you have uh, one of the greatest minds uh, and, and I don't know what you're going to say to this. You may completely disagree. I already know who you're going to say, and I already agree with you, <laughs> but go on. Let's who see if I'm say? right. Peterson. Were you going to say Peterson? Roger that. No, I was right. going to say him. He yeah. is, he is absolutely one of the great. Now, I don't know if you call him a philosopher. I don't know what you call the guy. He he's is a thinker. absolutely. Br- yeah. He's a thinker and he's brilliant because he does the thinking. He doesn't let other people think for him. Mm. Oh, wow. That sounds kind of crazy. Doesn't it? Like free mm-hmm. thinking. That's what America was founded on. Canada. Right? I mean, you've, you've, you've always kind of been, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be mean by saying this, but mm-hmm. you've been under the foot of other countries with mm-hmm. whether it was the French at one time or the Brits or whatever. So in America, we were under that foot too. And then after you guys come in and burn down the white house, 1812 there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but my, my point is now you got a guy like that, that, that if I was Canadian and I was the Canadian government, I would be embracing how amazing that dude is. And I would mm-hmm. be leveraging his thoughts and all the people that he has that he talks to. Cause he doesn't just talk to people that echo what he thinks. He talks mm-hmm. to people that are completely have a completely different view than him. And now they're talking about taking away his license to practice, which doesn't really matter because he's not going to practice anyway. Sure. However, that is ridiculous. The attacks that they that the government has put against that man. Yeah. Yeah. Re-education. So, Mandatory re-education is what, which was held up by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> um, why? Because his views differ because he is on social media and presenting in a way that's oppositional to what the status quo or the, I'm going to do air quotes, status quo is said to be. Yeah. I, philosopher, sure. Thinker. I just think he, it's like Einstein. He says, I'm not smarter than most people. I just spend more time thinking about a subject than other people do. And I, there's no doubt the guy's smart, but the amount of time and energy and effort that somebody will put in to look at a problem and not just try and justify why your pre, uh, assumed position is, is correct, but try and attack it from the other side as well. And then try and look at what history would say about it and try and look at how the other people and put that together and he'll formulate an opinion, I guess, not even an argument, so to speak, but an opinion on it yeah. that people will take as an argument. And uh, I, you know, I, th- I think we have a lot to learn in our social discourse and how we can talk with each other. I don't have to agree with a guy yeah, on think, everything like, to understand he's a thinker. He's, tr- I don't know. I don't know him. I've never met him. I would love to meet the guy. And I would ask him, if I met him, I would ask him one question. Do you want to guess what that would be? <sighs> okay. There's a whole bunch of questions going through my head, but, um. Uh, why don't you move to the well, States? Have, would be one of them. <laughs> I have, I have one question. So I'm a Christian. Okay. He, so, so my question he. to him. Okay. So is, is, is he, has he's publicly said he's a Christian? hundred percent. Oh, he has. Okay. Well then you've answered my question. I never need to meet him because that's the question <laughs> I have because he has dug so deep into Christianity and the Bible and he's explained it. He's mm-hmm. taken it down a different route than anybody I've ever heard discuss the Bible. And it's very intriguing to me. That doesn't mean I agree with everything he says, but mm-hmm. man, he inspires, he inspires thought. Yes. And I think that's, you know, that's like, uh, have you ever heard of, um, oh, what's his name? Um, on combat, unkilling, uh, Grossman, David Gross. Yeah. yeah Grossman. Grossman. So yeah. I've, He's been I've on read the podcast, Grossman's. Actually. Okay, good, good. He's a, yeah. he's a stellar dude. Sure he, he is. He's, he's an, yeah, he's an amazing guy, a good Christian guy and all that. Um, and I, I'm going to say this and I don't want to say this disrespectfully, but I disagree with some of the stuff he says. I agree. I, but I'm how did I boat. get there? How did I get to that? I listened to what he had to say. He inspired my own personal thought mm-hmm. and I made my own decisions and what's he's done right. in law enforcement and the military around the world, not just in America or Canada, but around the world, he's inspired soldiers and cops 
to think about the act of killing and think about all this stuff of being in a gunfight and everything so that when they get in that gunfight, if something happens, like you have, uh, um, like you start to lose your hearing because, uh, uh, what do they call that? Um, there's a name for it. But anyway, as you, as you get in that position, you have a, Auditory not exclusion. a physiological, but a psychological, uh, affects your hearing. Okay. Whatever. Yep. Well, yeah, yes. That may, that may or may not happen, but if it does happen, now you know, or you get tunnel vision or you, whatever it might be. And I think that, you know, that's like with, uh, the Christianity stuff with Jordan Peterson. He, he just, he's really made me think not just about that, but a lot of other stuff. And I have a hard time when I turn on any of his podcasts or any of that, I really have a hard time shutting it off because Mm -hmm. he can be talking to somebody about the stupidest trivial stuff and he'll Mm -hmm. inspire thought you know yes so and i I want to i want to so when i say 100 percent, i'm thinking about this now i want to make 100 percent sure that he has said that my recollection is that he said he's christian a friend of mine actually works on a security detail um maybe i'll see what we can do to uh to get a a reach out to uh, maybe ask that question or have that introduction made because uh Yeah, he is an interesting fellow. And the emotion, that's the other interesting thing, how emotional that he'll get about these different topics because he spent the time thinking about that. He looks at what history has to say about that. And the best predictor of future performance is going to be past performance. And I think he he can see where certain thought processes and politics will will be heading. And it's not always a pretty place. Yeah, he's got a, they've got a lot of their stuff right here in Nashville. I'm just outside of Nashville. So, um, I don't know if his daughter lives here or what, but daily wire, they do a lot of their stuff out of Nashville and and he's working with them now. So very interesting guy, but kind of going back to, um, kind of our backgrounds, the outdoor thing, you know, the clean water act is something that I, I kind of got a kick out of when the backcountry hunters and anglers were all hot and bothered about, well, you got to sign this thing saying that you support clean water. Well, oh, well, what kind of dirt bag doesn't support clean water? Uh Well, that's not what they were, that was not at all what they were trying to do. They were Mm. trying to take away our rights and they're trying to say that if a duck lands in a pond in this state and then it flies to another pond in another state, that's, that's, um, commercial or I forget what they call it. Uh, there's a name for it, but bottom line is they're trying to say that because of that, the um, EPA should control anything that has a bank, a bottom, and a high water mark. Interesting. So that's what they're pushing for. So let's let's talk about what has a bank, a bottom, or a high water mark. If you live in town, your you have a bank, a bottom, and a high water mark on your ditch. So that mm-hmm. means all of a sudden the EPA can come in and control what you put on your grass, or if you have a garden, what you put in your garden, they can control every possible thing. And backcountry hunters and anglers, I think I, I haven't tracked them for a while now, but I think they've been kind of called out for how goofball they were. Um, they were for backcountry hunters that were going in and smoking dope and, you know, they'd never really hunted, but like, man, I'm going to go, I can kill an elk and I'm going to go stick a few arrows and a few elk and eventually one's going to die. And I'm going to post some selfies with this elk. And then I'm going to go smoke more weed. And I'm like, (laughs) where I come from, if, if you smoke weed, you got to put that down on your 4473 and you're not allowed to buy a firearm, but where they're from, which is also in America, they must not have to do that. So I went to one of their get togethers here in Nashville just to kind of feel it out and you're going to think I'm lying, but this place I walked into was packed with a lot of very hairy, very smelly dudes. <laughs> there was three, there were three people in that place. Cause I, I really looked to find it. There were three people that were wearing shoes. Really? Me, Bunch my of- buddy. And they got a squirrel hunter that they put on meat eater often and he's right. kind of a character he he had boots on and and i had shoes on and my buddy had shoes on everybody else had like flip-flops or um oh what are the ones that all the hippies wear the uh 
Birkenstocks or Birkenstocks. Yeah. They all had yeah. like these and I'm like, bro, where I hunt, you can't wear <laughs> flip-flops. You got to wear shoes, man. You know, cause stuff will bite you or you can't climb up a hill or whatever. But at, after that, I'm like, yeah, I probably don't need to hang out quite with these cats. <laughs> and I think a lot of real hunters were kind of sucked into that. And now hopefully they're, they're more awakened to the fact that it might, they might not have actually been on the side of of true hunters, even one of the guys that was the main guy on their board, he ended up writing that that book, the gunfight book. Oh, which guy was um, this? Oh, let me see. What's his name? It was there, uh, Lan Tawny, I think, was the name of the uh, the yeah. Lead he was guy. the guy in charge. Uh, I got it right here. Let me look it up. It's um, Ryan Bussey. Okay that name so ryan bussy he he realized after 25 years in the firearm dist- industry that he was anti-gun mm. <laughs> how do you okay, wrote this, fair enough yeah he wrote this book about called gunfight and i i got a call one day from a guy he said man you made the book and i go what book he goes there's a book called gunfight i'm thinking that's awesome i'm in a book called gunfight then i find out it's about <laughs> this leftist dude that wants to take away guns from everybody and he said that Guys like me and and uh, Matt Best from Black Rifle Coffee, mm. we uh, have made it sexy to have the AR-15 and, and made it more acceptable, and we're just bad people for doing this. And I'm like, man, that's so awesome. <laughs> so I call up Matt Best. I call up Matt, and he's like, hey, what's up, Kyle? You know, And I go, you ain't going to believe it, bro, but you made it in this book called Gunfight. And he's like, whoa, that's awesome. What'd I do? And I said, they said that we're the the reason that so many people want AR-15s in America. And he's like, yeah, right on, you know. And so we were actually proud of of making it in the book for that. Um, I never bought the book because I don't want to I don't want to put my money in there. But uh, I just think it's interesting how things get twisted. And and you know, I guess the point of all this is not that you should not back good organizations, but you should really know what they truly stand for. I would say before you. You go out what there they, and what do they say about the road to hell? It's lined with good intentions, right? It's yep. clean water. Who wouldn't go want clean water? That's a great intention. Read it, go through, find out what the fine print says, because even the people with the best intentions might be going down that primrose path. Yeah. We, you know, we get, um, we get pushed in corners every now and again to do stuff for 501 C threes on the veteran side of things. And Mm. a few years ago, my wife went in for back surgery and, and, uh, as a military guy and, and I mean, I guess you could say this in Canada too. You, you kind of feel like if I go in for surgery, I'm going to get surgery because I was in the military that you get, you're supposed to get medical care for the rest of your life. Well, that's not quite the truest case. And I guess in Canada, you probably find that out every now and again too. And we went in there and they, they had her on the table, putting a little fancy hat on and getting her wired up. And then they said, oh, we just realized that they, uh, the insurance didn't approve your surgery. So we're not going to do the surgery. And at the time my wife could barely walk. She had this severe back injury that was less like a, a freak thing. And she needed to have that surgery now, or she could quite possibly lose the use of one leg permanently. And uh, she looked at me and kind of grimaced and she goes, the checkbook's in the center council of the, my truck, go grab it and just mm-hmm. write a check. So I went down and I grabbed the checkbook and I had to write a pretty big check to have her surgery. And then I had to write another check for the anesthesiologist. And when she, a few weeks, well, it was actually two months later when she finally kind of had this all behind her, she's up and walking. I mean, she was walking and pain free an hour after her surgery. Mm-hmm. So a couple months after this, she kind of finally gets her head clear from the stuff she's taken and she's back in it. And she goes, you know, if we would have been in the military, we couldn't have done that. And I would have had to go home and just get on painkillers. And I would have, who knows what mm-hmm. would have happened. And she goes, I want to start a 501 C3. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. And she goes, I want to start a 501c3 where we help people, not just military and law enforcement, but any human being. And 100% of the money that we take in goes to help them. So the moral of that story is not that, that I want you to send all your money to the Stay in the Fight Foundation. The moral of that story is 
go find the people that actually do with your money what you would do with your money. You know, mm. we don't we don't take one dime out for anything other than to help people. So that means all the administrative fees and all that comes out of our pocket. That's our tithe to that organization. And if, mm. if you send $100, that $100 is going to go to this person to help them, you know, do whatever. So it's, it's, it's made my brain hurt a little bit less because now I can say more, I can say no more often to people that, I don't know if they're actually doing that or if, if I research it or my wife researches, we can see exactly what percentage is going to help people and what percentage is going mm -hmm. to help themselves. And it's anyway, that's been a, a very interesting little ride for us. And, and we actually talked about this the other day because you're making knives. Yeah, I started, I figured it was, um, half face blades, Andrew Arabito chatting with him. He's like, Traff pick up a grinder, just start grinding away on some metals, just see what you can do. Right. So I did that I picked up a grinder and been playing around and now I just got a forge and buddy gave me an anvil. So I'm going to start playing with that a bit. Yeah. That's, but your knife making that you do, you can't buy your knives, so to speak, can you? No, you have to do a donation to the stay in the fight foundation. And, and it's a gift. It's not a, you're not, I don't know how to put it. I mean, we're doing it the legal way that we can do it. Uh, it was kind of funny. The last dagger I finished, um, this guy, he saw it. It wasn't even finished yet. And he goes, my buddy wants that. And I was like, I'm thinking it ain't for sale, bro. You know, cause mm -hmm. this is my first V42 dagger. I've, I've made other daggers, but not a V42, like a case V42 dagger, which was the original cool. knife that, um, well, it's the American and Ca Canada SF. In yeah. World War II, in 1942, that like knife was Sykes? what was issued. No, 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 no. That's a different knife. Okay. Now, this was de designed loosely on the, the Fairbairn Sykes, but this is a completely different knife. They wanted it different because they wanted uh, a more of a premium blade because a lot of those knives were made in in England and they were mass produced. They're, they're a fine knife, but they're mm. mass produced. So the stamped parts and this and that, drop forge, mm. whatever. The case that won that contract, and there was never a lot of them made, but you know, it was all those parts are still made by the original jobbers that made them in World War II, which is pretty cool. Mm. So it's a it's a it's a longer knife, it's a sleeker knife, it's hollow ground, it's there's a lot of cool stuff about it. So I had made this knife, and I, actually that knife I called it a V42, but it wasn't hollow ground. I've got five of them I'm making right now that some of them are hollow ground. Some of them have blood grooves, which the V42 never had. The V42 mm. is the dagger that had the thumbprint on one side. Right, you, okay, you, yes. Yeah, so it has a thumbprint, and that thumbprint was meant as an index point so you know which way the blade was. And it's like, if you look at that knife, I don't care which way the blade is. It's You're going to go through the ribs. It doesn't matter. It's such a sleek right. little blade. It's like 610 thousandths wide so it's a very thin thin blade so this guy says well my buddy said he'll give you a thousand dollars for that knife and i went sold you know i mean that's a great yeah. deal so then he calls me an hour later he goes yeah i talked to my buddy and and he changed his mind he's not going to give you a thousand dollars for that knife and i was like okay that's cool whatever i mean mm. i don't i mean it doesn't matter to me i'm doing it for my brain i'm not doing it for money i'm doing it for my mental health, you know? And, yep. uh, he says, yeah, he decided that because all the money is going to the stay in the fight foundation, he's going to give you $2,500 for that knife. And I'm wow. like, oh. wow. So he got the first V42. And then this guy that bought it, he actually bought another knife. Um, Alan Elishwitz, you're familiar with him. Very high end custom knife maker makes folding knives mm -hmm. predominantly. He has been a, a huge inspiration to me, not just inspiration. He's actually been an instructor to me and helped me learn how to hollow grind, how to just, he's a, he's just an amazing knife maker, mm. but he's an even better instructor. So, uh, I made some sand Mai that was three layers of, of, of 1084 and then two layers of nickel. And then he mm. made a dagger out of it. Well, this guy not only bought my knife, but he bought that knife as well. And all that money went to stay in the fight foundation. So my buddy called me later and he said, you know, the reason he did that was he, he said he can buy any custom knife he wants and it's only worth 800 or a thousand or $1,500 or whatever. But 
your knife is worth more because not because you made it, but because that money's going to go to help people. And I thought that was a good reality check for me because it's not worth any more because I made it. It's worth more right. because you're going to help people with that money. And and I also don't feel bad now, but when I say the other day we put a a little tomahawk out that I made. It's not a tomahawk. It's like a like something that you would get from Winkler knives and I had a sure. a, a scrapped piece of ADCRV2 which is what Daniel Winkler makes all of his out of. And Daniel Winkler, Winkler's been another guy that has just bent over backwards to help me with my my journey to make knives and and do this stuff. And uh, I made it kind of a weird shaped handle because the piece of scrap, I couldn't make a straight handle. So I make kind of a swoopy handle. And, and uh, cool. the other day we put it out online um, for $500. And a guy that's been in my classes bought that and he donated 500 bucks. So that's, it's, it's a very, to me, it's a very cool story of, of how this has went. And it takes a lot of pressure off me because I don't take orders and I don't take, I build what I want to build. And if I don't want to build it, if I want to throw it in the trash, I'm going to throw it in the trash. Yeah. I'm not thinking, man, this guy, Travis, I got to make this knife for him. And it's been six months. I got to get it. I got to get it finished. And the last thing I'm going to say is, I was going to send you some pictures of my knives, but after I saw your knives, I was like, well, this guy, he's already making better knives than me. So oh, give me a break. I've made, looked at your knives. Your, your knives are beautiful, dude. I mean, they are absolutely beautiful. My first few knives were forged. And well, I take that back. When I was a kid, I made knives in shop class in school. But uh, I guess that's probably frowned upon these days but <laughs> hey we all did that we all did it no your your knives are gorgeous and i think when you get that forge you're really going to enjoy it because it takes it it it, it changes stock removal is a lot of fun and i think mm. stock removal is a good way to refine your technique at least that's how i use it but then once i kind of refine that I, I, I will send you some pictures later i just did a couple Please. of integrals and taking a piece of steel actually i took seven pieces of steel and i i made this it looked like a big glob here with this one piece sticking out. And I forge welded that all together. And then that became, my, one of them I made a guard out of it. I, I'd never really seen that done as an integral. And I know guys do it, but I, I, I made it a little bit bigger than I should have. And I thought, man, I could mm. make that into a guard, not just into a bolster. So I made one with a bolster, a smaller knife. And then I made one with a guard, which is a pretty big, a pretty big knife. And I'll, I'll send you pictures of it, but it's... yeah. It, I'd never done that by myself. I made one with uh, Jason Knight, who's a, an unbelievable master bladesmith. And between him and Alan Leishwitz, uh, Alan taught me how to use a milling machine. And it, it's just been it's been just awesome. If you ever get to Nashville, you need to look us up because you come out here and we'll we'll heat up some steel and make something. I mean, it's oh, it's 100%. just so fun. I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I, uh, when it comes like I got the forge, I got one in, I look at this thing and I'm like, why did I order this? I could probably make this thing myself. Right. But fair enough. Now yeah. I know I can see what it looks like. It's a Atlas forge. I fired it up a couple times, just done the, um, whatever that treating is that they ship with it. I haven't put any metal in to bang away yet. I have like, when I was younger, I would do a bit of welding. Like I worked for an armored car company when I was 18 and like most of my jobs, I never actually did my job. I'd find other things that were interesting that I'd do it. I worked yeah, for a and yeah. as a teenager and I'm like, brand new place, eh? Um, do you have an alarm system? Oh no. Do you have security cameras? No, nope. I'll set them up. Do you need uh, cabinets built? So I'm paid as a fry cook and I'm building cabinets and doing their locks and alarms, everything but my job. So same thing with the armored car company. And uh, I look in the corner and I see all these uh, broken aluminum hand trucks and, uh, oh, what are you guys doing with that? Oh, I don't know. We just piling them up and maybe one day we'll fix them. I said, well, if I could fix them, would you guys pay me? <laughs> right. And, uh, can you yeah. weld aluminum? I'm like, um, I've never welded aluminum in my life. I'm like, sure, sure. Like, <laughs> let me see. Right. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. And there was probably no YouTube video on it back then. There, there was it, but I go to the welding shop and, uh, they say, uh, I, I had access to a little TIG welder and I was playing around TIG welding. I'm like, yeah, your, your TIG welder, it doesn't have enough power to be able to weld these thick aluminum hand trucks, but you can stick weld aluminum with these special rods. So I started doing that. Um, 
I don't even know where where the hell I was going with this story. But uh, anyways, work, working with all the uh, the metal, I, I have a background a bit in playing with metal. I have no idea what I'm going to do when it comes down to forging. Like, do I, uh, I, I get Damascus, I get that and send why that looks so cool. Like I, I guess you want to form it in an anaerobic environment if possible, weld it into a, uh, uh, container. Yeah, well, yeah, yes and no. Here's what I would say. Listen to some of these guys that do it for a living and you're going to hmm. get completely different stories. And I'll give you an example. Kyle Royer, do you know who that is? I, I've heard the name, but no, I don't know who. He he is, if you were going to say who's the top master bladesmith in America right now, he, and everybody got in there and gave an answer, mm. a lot of people are going to put him in the top five. Mm. Now, are there other people that are just as creative? Absolutely. But his work is just stunning. And he's... He does classes online and I'm signed up. So every beginning of the month, he downloads his videos and you can go on there and he does a really good job. He's kind of a kooky dude. He's ADHD guy as well. Sure. That's why he's successful. But I've sure. picked up so many little tidbits from him and I've seen how he makes Damascus. And then I've watched how uh, Jason Knight makes Damascus. Mm. They both end up with the same finished product but you get to choose how you're going to, are you going to do this way that Kyle Royer does it? Or are you going to do the mm. way that Jason Knight does it? I've done it both ways. And, and what I would say is I don't like breaking a canister off when I'm done. So like, I don't like welding right. everything up with sheet metal and then having to take it off. So I'm probably going to use the Jason Knight technique, which is not to do that. Okay. And if you do it right and your steel is clean and you, you know, there's different ways guys spray it with WD-40, they dip it in kerosene, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. Mm. And I've experimented and I can get, a, now with San Mai, I actually do weld the whole billet. And the reason I do that with San Mai is because it's simple. You weld all the way around the edge. Mm. With San Mai, you're generally not going to forge the knife all the way out. You're going to, you're basically forging a piece of steel and then you're going to do, you're going to cut it out like you would, you know, to do a, a, a stock removal blade okay. so yeah when you get ready to do that just just ring me up and i'll i'll just walk you through what i've done and it's if you ever if you're going to do san mai um nickel is a really good steel to start with because san mai forge weld welds it doesn't have to be extremely hot it's got to be pretty hot mm. but it doesn't it's it, it it forge welds really really well um okay. and what i'm using is that nickel sheeting that is behind lights like in your the lights in your ceiling have that little piece of nickel that reflects that's what i'm right. using is that some of that sheeting right there so it's oh. only got to be enough to to and i'll have to send you some pictures too i've got some uh some knives i've done with that that are that are very cool but sand mai is fun because it's not as much work as as damascus the other thing i was going to say is if you really want a good workout go ahead and knock out that damascus it's a uh, it's good a workout, job, eh? man. When you do that by hand, I've got a 25 ton press now, so that changed my world. But uh, doing that with the first couple billets I did were with my arm, and it, <laughs> it, You're it feeling was a it, lot eh? of work. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's how guys did it. You know, a lot of guys still do it that way. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be jumping into the big press or the uh, the the hydraulic or electric hammer forges, uh, quite yet, but, um, who knows? We'll see where it takes me. I, all I know oh. is I'm learning things. I'd, uh, what's a Ricasso? Okay. I got to learn this, a choil in different places. There's so much that I don't know about knife making right now that, uh, I, I don't even know what I don't know. I don't know what to even ask. Yeah. And that's, I, I didn't know either. And then, uh, what was funny, Alan Elishwitz and I were friends before I started making knives and I, I said, yeah, check it out. And I sent him a picture and he goes, bro, you suck. And I'm like, <laughs> what? well, he's just an honest guy. He's, he doesn't, I appreciate that. I do too. As an instructor, I don't want you to mm -hmm. tell me I'm doing great. If I'm not doing great, I want to learn. So he mm -hmm. goes, yeah, bro, you suck. And he goes, I'm coming. He goes, I I'm going to teach you how to grind. Okay, so he doesn't just say I suck and then turn and go the other way. He says right. I suck, and by the way, I am going to teach you. And I thought I was mm -hmm. like, dude, you tell me when I should come. And he goes, 
you ain't coming to my shop. He goes, mm. I'm coming to your shop. I'm going to teach you how to grind on your equipment. Beauty. So this dude shows up with grinding jigs, and because he does his stuff very precise. He makes 18 knives, usually at a time, I think it is. And when he gets done with 18 knives, you can take the parts from one folding knife and put them in another folding knife. And they, wow. I mean, and he's not doing any CNC. It's all done by hand. I mean, he's doing wow. it on machines, but he's, there's no CNC. So he tells me this, and I'm like, okay, bro's going to come to my house and teach me on my grinder. Oh, my goodness. It was unbelievable. And he showed up, and he told me this. He said, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll, I'm going to say it. You can <laughs> bleep this out if you want. Sure. He said, uh, he said, we're only going to hollow grind. And I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking, I don't know how to flat grind right, and he's going to teach me mm. how to hollow grind. And I said, well, why don't you flat grind? He goes, dude, flat grinding's for fags. And I said, <laughs> okay. Now, he's joking because you got of a lot course. of these top knife makers. You look at Winkler knives, they're, they're all flat ground. There's nothing wrong with flat grinding a knife. Yeah. But for him, he gives it this different look because that's, that's kind of his trademark. And these crazy grinds that he does, compound grinds. Like the other day, I was talking to him about an S grind. Are you familiar with that? I, uh, I think so. I got this book um, by Knife Nerds, and they got these different things. But the S grind would be a hollow grind with a uh, uh, convex with at a, the end. Would that be? Well, it's or a, it's a, a hollow grind. grind with a. Fl it's a flat grind at the edge of the knife, and all it yeah. is, it's a compound grind. So people are calling it a S grind. I don't know why, but mm -hmm. it's a flat grind. So that if you use a kitchen knife, you cut through something, then it hits the hollow, and mm. and then the food will fall away from that. So the first sure. couple knives I made for my wife, I, I hollow ground them. And a hollow ground knife is a horrendous, it's a horrendous kitchen knife. Everything, Everything sticks, sticks to, it. to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it, I can keep it sharp because a razor, like a razor, they're all hollow ground. They're hollow ground to a mm. zero, which is another fun one. You don't shave. I don't shave much either. But making a, making a razor is a is a challenge and i actually made one for a buddy of mine who passed away before i was able to give it to him and i've just sat there staring at him at that thing because now it's it's like depressing to look at that razor because <laughs> he had a heart attack and anyway someday i'll probably finish it and i'll give it to his brother but making that blade was difficult so the i showed um i wanted to do a hunting knife with an s grind because meat on an animal is just not quite to the kitchen yet. So basically it's, right. it's a kitchen knife. It's just the, the meat's not in the kitchen yet. And uh, right now we have a company we're working with that they're, they're making a hunting knife for us that'll be an S grind, a compound grind like that, a, hol a flat grind up for about almost a half an inch and then it goes to a, a hollow. So that's something that I've been yeah. working with. There's a guy named Salem Straub who is a, if you haven't seen his stuff, you should look at his YouTube channel because he does unbelievable videos of how to make Damascus. He's a guy that does that chain link Damascus and crazy mm. stuff. And then there's another guy up in, he's not in your neck of the woods, but he's Canadian as well. Vet, Vetchon Knives, have you heard of him? No. V-A-C-H-O-N. I don't know the guy. I've never actually held one of his knives, but he is... He's a very good instructor from just watching his little video clips, and he actually runs mm. classes at his place. And he's just north of the border. Uh, I want to say he's like just north of New York. I, okay. I, I looked it up because I thought, man, if I could get up there and take a class, he'd be a fun guy to go. He does mostly uh, kitchen knives. Okay. But, you know, a guy that does a kitchen knife, I think, is a a good guy to learn from simply because they're using such a thin piece of steel. Whereas yeah. a guy that makes, you know, like Salem Straub, he's making knives that are, I want to say 90 or hundred thousands thick at the spine. Mm. And he's, that's why his hollow grinds on the sides, they're like a 30 inch um, wheel. So he's using a platen that yep. simulates a 30 inch circumference wheel or not. Okay. What is it? Diameter, 30 inch diameter right. um, wheel there. So anyway, I, I went down a rabbit hole there. I'm sorry. There's that ADHD oh, no, I... thing again. I guess I better go for another walk, you know? 
<laughs> there's so much there that I'm, I'm just absorbing and learning as you're talking. Yeah. The straight razors. So I, I'll use a straight razor to, uh, to tidy up. I think the geometry is neat because you use the back of the knife or the razor to yep. sharpen it essentially you get all your angles. So that's probably takes a little bit of math to figure out how you're going to build this thing. Um, and to get your knives, I've read that, you know, it's got to hurt, right? If you're going to make a donation, we don't have a set price on here, but, uh, I want it to hurt. And it kind of reminded me of, um, what was it? The widow with the two mites. If, uh, that rings a bell for you being no. a Christian and through the, the, uh, all these, uh, rich guys are coming in and making their donations and, uh, and there's Jesus and his disciples and they're like, oh, look at how great that guy is. Now it's money he left. And this widow comes in and she's got two, was it leptons, mites, two, like half pennies, like quarter pennies, whatever they are. And oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, uh, you got to give till it hurts. So it's not that it's going to be X amount, but you know, just give in a way that it's going to make, uh, um, uh, it's going to be meaningful for you. I like that. I like that approach. You know, it, it, it hurts different for different people too. Mm -hmm. And where I live, I live in a, I don't want to say a depressed area because people here are all working and they're living, they're doing fine. But the county we're in is, is not a rich county. So when a guy comes over and gives me $200 for one of the very first knives I ever forged, mm. I was ecstatic about that. He was mm. ecstatic about that. And, and, and he's a guy, I mean, $200, he's a blue collar dude. $200 is a, that's a lot of money. Sure. Another guy gives us a check for $10,000. That's actually less than the $200 guy gave. Now I'm right. very thankful for the $10,000. I'm very thankful yep. for any time that we get any donation. I mean, it, 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 yep. it amazes me. We had two things happen. We had a bunch of things come in and we needed money and we're like, we're out of money. So what are we going to do? Mm. Before we made the decision, my wife went and checked the mail. We got a check for $10,000. Just so like that, eh? That's a God thing. That's not us. Uh -huh. That's God saying, okay, you used up what you got and you did okay. At least that's what I'm hoping he's thinking. <laughs> and here's a little <laughs> bit more money. And then the other thing that happened was throughout the year, we took in money and we spent it for the causes that, you know, it might be some lady that's abused that has now got to pay her first and last month's rent. So we're going to pay that so she can get out of that abuse situation and get into a house or uh, a little girl needs a helmet because she has a choice wear this helmet or have head surgery. The helmet's a mm. much less invasive way to do it. We pay for the helmet. Well, at the end of the year, Melinda does the paperwork and we were 13 cents difference from what we took in and what we spent. Wow. So that makes me a, a pretty happy dude, but the universe. Yeah, is we went down a rabbit hole, man. You and I, I mean, we might be on this thing for eight hours to get through all this information. <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't mind that touch. I don't, and I'm conscious of your time. I, I wouldn't mind touching on the leadership aspects because, you know, it, you've said before, you know, everybody wants to talk about Somalia. There's a lot more to me than what happened over there. Right. And you've got in a book that's so highly reviewed on leadership coming from somebody who's clearly had some good mentors and good instructors and been able to put this to the test. Um, you know, as a youngster, I remember 12 years old, I was taught and I had to remember it. Leadership is the art of influencing human behavior as to accomplish a mission in the manner so desired by the leader. Fair enough. It's one thing to memorize that. Now, how do we affect that? So your, your book that you've put out speaks to leadership from a, such a wide perspective and it's, it's refreshing the, the way that things are put together in there. What drove you to want to make that book and what are some of the formative, I think you might've already told me one about your past teacher there, but formative leaders that uh, really influenced how you, uh, how you move forward. Well, so the, the way it came about, <clears throat> so Somalia was a, a interesting time in my military career and it, it wasn't, it was not my defining moment, you know, and I don't really know if you said right now, like, what's your defining moment in life? 
I'd probably have to say when my children were born. Yep. Because that's defined like, dude, this is for real. Getting mm-hmm. married is awesome, but you're bringing a baby into this world. You better pull your head out of your butt and mm. you're, you're now responsible not just for your wife, you're responsible for this little girl and then a couple years later, this little boy, you know, now life's easy because we got grandkids and it, it's fire and forget. We can get them all sugared up and then throw them back <laughs> at mom and away we go, you know? Yeah. But I think Somalia did, was inspirational for me. So as a, as a soldier, there's a lot of things I learned on the battlefield that day good and bad. Mm. I I got to see good and I got to see not so good. Mm. And then I got to go on with the rest of my career. And are we going to just continue to be not so good? Are we going to try to be great and be better at everything that we do? And I'm not just talking about leadership. I mean, if you said right now, what, what's the very most important thing that a soldier should learn? It ain't leadership. It's medical training. Because mm. if, if you can't medically take care of your mates on your left and your right, because if you get up and you walk outside, you get hit by a Jeep, you got to treat them. And it ain't, you're not even in a combat environment and you got to provide first aid. So I guess m- my point there is that defined me as far as I wanted to be a better instructor for people. If I'm going to train them how to shoot, mm. I can go back to Somalia or Desert Shield, Desert Storm or my time in Iraq or whatever. And I can talk about why I'm teaching you this technique. I'm not just Mm. pulling this out of my butt. There's a reason I'm teaching you to use this position to think about this or whatever. So fast forward, I met this guy. I was at a shooting range out in California and he's a DEA guy named Bill Lutz. Super good dude. And I'm doing this five-day class for these DEA guys and some FBI guys and some law enforcement dudes. And he keeps talking about this guy coming in and teaching this leadership class. And the guy he's talking about was not respected at all in our community. Mm. He performed uh, very poorly in Somalia and was not well thought of by his guys or our unit guys either. Okay, I'm a positive dude, so I'm not going to say that to this guy. Mm-hmm. Well, it was like day four we're done night training. We're driving back to the hotel. It's one o'clock in the morning. He starts in again about this dude and his leadership. And I just lost it. I'm like, dude, the guy's a dirt bag. Nobody appreciates him. I don't know what you guys see in him, but Mm -hmm. whatever. And he's like, Oh, (laughs) sorry, dude. I didn't know I hit a, I hit an open wound there. And I, and I, I didn't have an open wound. I just, I was just like, you don't really know what you're talking about. So check. I go home, everything's fine. Probably a month later, I got a DVD in the mail. And it just has a little note. It's like, I'd appreciate if you would watch this. And it's from this guy. And he sent me a video of this guy giving his leadership presentation. Hmm. And I'm a note, I'm a note guy. I've got my, my book of notes, always have a book that I'm (laughs) filling with notes and I've got them all marked. This one's not marked yet because it hasn't been finished. If you go to my shelf over here, my wife marks them when I started, when I finished each book so that if I go, man, I had this thing going on. It was like six months ago. She's like, Roger that boom, this book here and I'll go through it. Oh, there it is. And I'll find it and, and I'm good to go. So I sit down to watch this video and right away I'm like, whoa, there's a lie. So Mm. I pull out my notebook and I write down lie number one, Mm. number two, number three, number four. And I get done with this video and there's 12 lies about what happened in Somalia or about leadership. And I was pretty fired up because I was offended by somebody lying I don't know if he's trying to make himself look good or I don't, I don't know what's going on, but the guy was a pathetic performer. So mm. he's thinking of himself completely differently than anybody else around him, which tells me that you're completely unaware and you're not a good leader or a great leader. If that's how you're thinking, because you should be thinking mm. more about your people than about yourself. Yep. So I called him up and I said, yeah, I got the video and I watched the video and 
He's like, well, what do you think? And I said, when do you want me to come and give you a true leadership seminar? Something mm-hmm. to that effect, you know? And he's mm-hmm. like, well, when, are you, when will you be ready? And I said, I'm ready right now. And he goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute there, tough guy. Because that's how this guy talks. He goes, wait a minute there, tough guy. What's your presentation going to be? And I said, well, I'm just going to, you know, and I kind of, I was mad, yeah. you know? And because he's disrespecting all the Rangers that were his guys. He's disrespecting all the unit dudes. And over the next six months, I put together the Leadership in the Shadows seminar. Mm. And and it's nothing like it. It's nothing like the book. It's, it, it, it is now, but at the time it was, I thought I kind of had a seminar put together. So this guy then ends up hiring me to go up to teach at the DEA. And I think I did a, I forget what the first one was, but it was, it was some experienced leaders. It wasn't just a bunch of chumps. It was guys that mm. they knew with guys and gals that, that were professionals and knew what they were doing. Mm. And when I went up there, this guy, Bill and another buddy of mine, John, they, they sat there and they, they tore me apart mm. and they, when I got done, each guy handed me pages and pages of notes and I'm like, Roger that. So what do you do with that? What do you, what, wh- I was inspired because the guy was lying and I wanted to make sure I was yep. telling the truth. So I told the truth, but did, did I tell it in an inspirational way? Did I tell it in a, a catching way? Did I tell it in a way that draws you in and makes you part of the story and makes you think mm. like, how does this apply in my life or in my job or whatever? And I didn't do that. I, I accomplished some of that. So I'm like, okay, Roger that. So I took all their notes and I completely, my wife and I redid that seminar completely. Six months later, I'm standing up there in front of a group again. And those two guys are sitting in the back taking notes and their list got shorter. And by about the third or fourth seminar, I was, I was getting just a couple of notes for the entire seminar that they thought I should polish up or, you know, the way I I should have put this before that or whatever. Mm -hmm. So because of those guys helping me and and mentoring me, and and I think, I mean, I can do as good, if not a better job than them getting up there to speak. And I'm not saying that they're not good presenters. I'm just saying that I, I can hold my own as a presenter, Sure. but as a customer, you've got to be able to give, if I'm going to mentor you to, to get up and speak in front of people, I've got to put on a different hat and say, okay, I'm the customer. What would I think and how would I feel here and, and all of that? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I start doing these leadership in the se- uh, shadows seminar all over the country and, and people are hiring me and I'm doing a lot of them for the federal law enforcement guys and for the military. And then uh, there's a cop down in Florida named Matt Busella and he's a former uh, naval aviator. And uh, he says, uh, he called me Sparky, which <laughs> okay. kind of bothered me because we had sure. a guy on our, our team named Sparky who was killed in Somalia. That was his call sign was Sparky. Mm. And it, I never really told him that, but I'm like, it just kind of grates on me because Sparky was Earl Fillmore and blah, blah, blah. Mm. He goes, when are you going to write the book, Leadership in the Shadows? I'm like, well, you know, and I kind of was slow rolling him because I'd written a couple books at the time. I wrote the the Green Eyes and Black Rifles and then Stay in the Fight, the pistol book. Yep. And he, uh, one day he called me up and he goes, and he, he and I really hit it off. And I don't know why, because we're, we're not the same kind of person, but he's just a, he's a super good dude, very good cop, um, mm. great thinker, reader. He's a good, good guy. Calls me up and he says, uh, you got to write this book. And I said, well, you're going to help me write this book. And he goes, well, I can't write the book for you. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to write the whole book, but will you give me honest feedback on this book? And I didn't know what I was asking for when I said honest Mm. feedback. This dude could not have been more honest. And that's Mm. what you need if you've got somebody that's Mm going to help you read a book and make sure that's not a a big pile of crap, you know? Right. Um, And I said, well, what do you want for that? I says, because I got to pay you. I don't want anything. And I said, no, I'm going to pay you. What do you want to get paid? And he goes, when I get done, I want two VTAC t-shirts. Perfect. (laughs) And I was like, okay. He's not going to tell me what he wants. Well, when we finished the project, he called me up. He goes, I believe you owe me two t-shirts. And <laughs> we sent him VTAC t-shirts. That's the only thing that man has ever asked of me for that 
for helping me with that book. So that's one thing. Second mm-hmm. thing is uh, the guy that edited that book is a now the command sergeant major in charge of 10th Special Forces Group, Kevin Dorsch. And mm-hmm. he edited the book. And it was nice to have a guy that had been an English teacher before he came in the Army, joined the military, became an SF guy. Now at the time he was like an E8, E8 I think, when he edited my mm-hmm. third book. And uh, so he gave me a good perspective too. So now that that's all done. Everything's ready. I'm like, I have a manuscript that I feel is very good. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the last check? Well, I hand it to my wife and I go, here it is. And I had it in this big binder and she takes it and she starts reading it over, you know, a day or day and a half or whatever. She hands it back to me. She goes, there you go. I think you got a little work to do. (laughs) And I go, so this is your baby. Like you've been working on sure. this for a few yep. years and you get very emotional about your attachment to this project and how much work you've put into it. And you mm-hmm. don't want to start over. And mm-hmm. honestly, what she told me, I had like five chapters in the book. She had X the entire chapter, not a word, not a paragraph, the entire chapter. She goes, you need to rewrite this chapter. And I'm like, well, let, and she goes, I'm going to tell you the subject and you're going to rewrite the chapter. You're not going to look at any of your notes. You're not going to look in this book. You're Mm. going to rewrite that chapter. And I was like, okay, can you give me some guidance? Like what's, why is that? And she goes, I can tell that you were either tired or in a bad mood when you wrote that chapter. Mm. And she goes, you're, you're a positive person and you want this to be a positive experience because ultimately you want people to take something good away from it. You don't need them to take anything bad. Mm -hmm. Who cares? It's bad stuff. There's everybody can point out the bad. What can we do? That's good. Let's move on with the the positive and be better at the end of the day. Wow. I rewrote those five chapters and those five chapters were 5,000% better than the original chapters that I wrote. So since then she's become kind of my go-to first cut on some of this stuff. And right now I'm actually, I've just about got another book finished and it's war stories from the Bible. Right, I've I was going to ask you that one. Yeah, I've rewritten some, not rewritten. I'm writing them as, I don't know what you would call it. It's, it's historical fiction because we don't know exactly what happened when Jael drove a tent peg through a guy's temple. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've never done that. I don't know what that's like, but I'm going to venture to guess that when you got a wooden mallet and you got a wooden tent peg, that's not an easy task. There'll but that old gal did it. Yeah, she she did it. So what did she think about? What led her to do that? And then what did she feel after it? And what did you know, what did the old guy that come in there and he wanted some water and she gave him some milk and mm. he fell asleep and she pinned his head to the ground with a tent peg? Okay, that's mm. a story I want to hear. Or like Ehud the assassin that and you'll like this one. Ehud, are you familiar with him who made the the dagger he he made yes yeah he the went big... and he killed king egg yeah 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 he made it, it's like 18 inches long he he yeah. took it in there and he killed you know he killed king eglon with this dagger and the things that i learned from that was i wrote this story and everything and my buddy reads it and he's a preacher and the other guy was a missionary and he goes you said he tested it on a pig and i'm like yeah and he goes bro he was a jew he would have never touched a pig and mm. I was like, man, I never even thought about that. And then the other guy Good says, "Good point." so how did he make this? He, f- You said he forged this steel. They didn't have did steel. Did they have steel? No, they didn't have steel. So that the, at the most, they would have had bronze. So mm. how do you make bronze? Well, I had to research, like, how do you take tin and copper and melt them and, and pour it? You know, it's not a big thing that's going to be forged, but it's something that you're going to pour and then you're going to file and and polish Mm. and do all this stuff. So I had to research how to do that. And then I told the story of how he made a form, beat the form down with a hammer, laid this dagger in there with some dust so that when he opened the box back up, there was a form of the dagger and then he closed it back up. And then he poured the, the molten bronze (laughs) in there and made this bronze dagger. And then he went in and killed this King. And that's the story I want to read that Mm. it never got told completely in the Bible, because if the Bible went as in-depth as I've went with each one of these stories, the Bible would be, you know, 500 times longer. And uh, 
the goal with this book is to inspire people to believe, to have faith, and also to maybe dig a little bit deeper and go read the Bible because there's some great stories. I'm a I'm a warrior. I'm a military guy, so I'm a Old Testament dude because mm-hmm. there's a lot of good killing in the Old Testament. Yes, there um, is. Smiting, I guess they call it smiting. You know, <laughs> uh, but I did include yeah. some some New Testament stuff too. I've got Paul the Apostle in there, and and. Some of these people, you're going to say, like, how do you get a war story out of Paul the Apostle? But then Mm. when you realize that what he went through as an apostle, you know, being made blind and then recovering from that and then following Jesus and this, the whole, his whole life was more of a, a battle than a lot of those guys that we look at as these great warriors from the Bible. Um, when he was tortured, you know, do you know what, um, so when they gave him the, they beat him with rods, or if you're familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Do you know what a fasces is? No. So they no. had a, they had a, a thing. Now, now picture like a, a picture like a bearded axe. Let's just, because yeah. you can picture that, right? Yeah, so yeah. picture a bearded axe, but around the handle of the bearded axe, they've taken these birch rods, and they have put a bundle of those around this handle. And this guy that stands there to give the beating, he's the guy that holds this. And when it's time for this guy to get beat, they take Paul and they take his buddy and they lay him over these rocks and they're they're stripped naked. And he pulls out the first rod and he starts to beat him until that breaks. And then he gets the next Mm -hmm. rod and he beats until that breaks and they give him his, you know, whatever number of lashes they're going to, they're going to give him. Um, Man, that's a, that's a stud that's better than Johnny Rambo that can sit there and take right. that beating. And then the thing that was interesting about that is he was a Roman citizen. So at any time he could have said, hey, bro, I'm a Roman citizen. And they couldn't have done that to him. Mm-hmm. But what did he do? He knew that his buddy was going to get beat. So he took the no same shot. beating as his buddy was going to take. And at any point he could have been a sissy like I would have been and said, whoa, whoa, I'm an American. You can't do that. Whoa, I'm Canadian or, you know what I'm saying? Sure. sure. You know, I could, like, I would have said, hey, right on, eh? You know, you're about to, you're about to, to beat a Canadian over here. You know, don't you know I'm a Canadian, eh? You know, and, and they would have had to stop. So got almost down anyway, that's, you, yeah, that's, that's how those stories go. I want guys to be inspired. And I, I, this is going to sound kind of weird i guess to say but we only need to sell one of those books just and actually the right person sell it we need we need one of the right people to read that book that's all we need Mm. you know what i'm saying like it doesn't matter it it it, um I'll, i'll use your podcast as an example I was doing a, a podcast and my buddy said, well, how many downloads did you get on your podcast? And I told him, he's like, well, we're getting like, you know, a hundred. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but you just told me a story about one of those guys that listened to your podcast, um, decided not to kill himself because of your podcast. Mm-hmm. You see the Massive. impact that you can have. One person, one person listens to that podcast and they don't take their life. I would chalk that up as a successful podcast. You know, on the other side of it, I don't want to get too overly religious here, but everybody worries about their number of followers, like on Instagram and Faceplant and all this stuff. Um, Mm. Jesus had 12. Mm Mm-hmm. And it look where it went from there. So Mm -hmm. I I've had to kind of step back from this book a little bit because we actually had a book agent for a while and he was trying to shop it around and and book people don't want another Christian book. You know, they wanted me to write my story like about being a soldier and being in the unit and doing all this. And I'm like, no, that's, that's never getting written. This Mm -hmm. is the book. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. if it's like, Nope, never mind. We're, and the guy was a great guy. It wasn't his fault. It was the, the, the people he was trying to sell the book to. He was doing a great job. But at the end, my wife and I were like, we just, we're just going to do this like we did the previous books. 
And it'll be on Amazon, it'll be on our website, it'll be available, and we just need that one guy. We need that one young soldier to pick it up and read it and realize that there's a different way, you know? So I really like that. You know, my ADHD entrepreneur hat goes on with each one of those stories that's in there. So you've got a, that dagger that's 18 inches. That's about a cubit, I think, in, in length, bronze. You had, what was that other device that you said was, uh, the fastest, the yeah. That? yeah, the f- fastest. Yep. What if you made one of each of these weapons and had it as a, um, sort of like the auction items or something to go along with the stories that, that I wonder if that'd be an interesting way to be able to promote, raise awareness and also raise, uh, uh, money for the, for the nonprofit, for what you're doing. Just not that you had to you're already me, you're, a, <laughs> you're, you're trying to make me do a lot of work, bro. That's a lot of work. Not that you don't already yeah. have a lot of things on your plate. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny you say that because Jason Knight, he's a, a Christian as well. And he said he wants to get together with me and we want to make a Hood's dagger. Mm. And I'm like, that's the perfect, you know, that's kind of down the, the road that you said there. Um, yeah. The other thing, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, maybe I'll get in trouble for this, but um, every chapter is going to have a special picture that goes with the chapter, and it will be of the dagger, the hammer, the tent peg, the mm. fasces. It'll be, it'll be a specific thing from that chapter. And what's really cool about that is it's my wife figuring out what that is, and then it's my son-in-law doing all the artwork. That's so it's, cool. it's, 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 it's a family thing here, you know, and, and, um, he's my son-in-law. So of course I got to be a little mean to him every now and again, because he's married <laughs> to my daughter, but he's a stellar dude, also a Christian. And he's, he grew up in Argentina. Now he's American, but you know, a super dad to my grandkids and everything. And it's, it's been, it's fun. He gets super motivated. He, he writes as well. And he's a, a, a spectacular artist, but his writing is, is stellar as well. Um, but he writes like, uh, oh, what would you call it? Uh, like fantasy thriller type stuff. So like on another mm. planet or, you know, sure. stuff like that. And I've read, I read one of the books that he just wrote that he hasn't, he hasn't, uh, got it published yet, but it's very, very good. It's not really my kind of book, but it was, it really drew me in. So it's, it's nice to have an artist like that, that can, take a picture or read my picture and then draw it, you know? You've so. mentioned your wife numerous times through here and she sounds like, like oh, I can refer to my wife as a force multiplier. Um, would you have these books out if it wasn't for your wife? Would you have, no. have you heard of the term, uh, doubling and it's an ADHD sort of thing? I'm just curious. This is my own personal curiosity here but I've got all these ideas and energy and things I want to do. And sometimes I just need somebody beside me while I do it. And they, they call this doubling. Like my wife will come in and every once in a while I'll bounce an idea off or I'll ask for help on certain little things here and there. But basically I'm then doing the project. If I've got to write something, I'm not a good writer. It takes me a lot of work to write something. And I've played around with just blog posts and short story, short things, right? Um, but I don't get off the ground unless I got, got her beside me for at least to get this thing rolling. Do you do anything like that? Is that a similar? Yeah, kind of like the writing. I'm a self-starter on the writing. I love to write and I feel like I'm a, a decent writer. Recently yeah, I've started writing some poetry and uh, my poetry's, as my wife says, she goes, I was going to read something the other day and my wife goes, just be advised. His stuff's a little bit dark and <laughs> it's it's honest. So it's, Mm. some of it's dark because inside my brain or my heart, sometimes it's a little bit shadowy there, you know, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, my writing is, is sometimes she's got to push me like, Hey, you need to get back on that project. Roger that. Mm. But what she does is she runs our business. Um, make sure that, you know, products are going out the door out of our warehouse because everything that we sell ships out from our warehouse. Mm. Um, comes up with, you know, like you're wasting time on this project. What are you doing? And I've some, I'm an, 
I'm not a numbers guy, but I'm a goal guy. And if I look at it, I'm like, why did I put all my time into this and it didn't produce anything? Mm. Well, if it's not for the betterment of humankind or anything like that, sure. why am I wasting my time with this other company that is we've we've made nothing? And over here, there's this little silent company that's just crushing it, and I'm not giving them any love. So mm. she's the one that kind of keeps me like, you need to get away from this company and go to these guys because they're actually producing. Um, then the other side of that is I'm a goal person. So I set a goal, you know, like maybe I'll set a fiscal goal. Like we need to do this much business or make this much money and not because I'm a money hungry person, but money does allow you to have a little bit of freedom. And Mm -hmm. if, if we have enough income or we have enough money in the bank, it allows me to start thinking of working on some of the projects that mean more to me than standing on the range, doing up drills with a bunch of students, which I love Mm -hmm. that. And I love to be an instructor but if I do that every day, I don't have the energy to write this book. I don't have the energy right. to do another product or, or whatever it might be. So I've set some lofty goals. And because of my wife, we've attained those goals. Um, yeah, I feel bad for people that don't have a good partner in crime like that. Um, we're lucky. And, and, and not a lot of people that are married have are evenly yoked. Mm. And by evenly yoked, I don't just mean working or being on the same team, but my wife is spiritually, mentally, physically, everything. We are, we are yoked together. She is absolutely the only person on this planet that 100% has my back, you know, and if things go bad, yeah, if things go bad, you, you see in the, in this industry, whether it's firearms or fishing or whatever it is, somebody does something, people will turn oh, yeah. their back on that individual in a in a heartbeat without even knowing the circumstances. So I know that she's always going to be there with me. So that's, you know, we've been married now 36 years. Um, that's a long time. That's a really yeah. long time. We were married before I joined the Army. We got married a couple weeks before I left for the military and... Somehow we made it through all that and strong woman. Yeah. She's super strong. She's way stronger than I'll ever be, you know? So yeah, I guess we are doubling. We're doing something. It's, it works because, you know, and she, she gets, she sits here and watches when I'm reading something or she's giving me feedback on a project and I'm kind of like giving her the eye and it's not Mm. that I'm upset. It's this, that I'm trying to soak this all in and trying to understand what she's talking about. Cause sometimes we're on different sheets of music and it's just, she's got to hang in there and explain it more so that I finally get it. Yep. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to give you one quick example. So she told me one day we were at my daughter's house. She said, I have this great idea for a chapter in your, your Bible book. And I'm like, okay, ah, I'm ready. What's the, what's the idea? And she goes, the angels roared. And I'm like, okay, tell me about it. And she's like, yeah, well, like when Jesus was crucified, the angels roared. And I'm like, I can't see it. I don't, I don't Mm -hmm, get it. mm -hmm. I just don't get it. So I didn't get it for like a year and a half. And then one day, man, I got it. And Mm -hmm. Now, as a storyteller, she's not a storyteller. I'm the storyteller. Mm. So imagine if you were the archangel and these all these angels, and, and, and what are you doing? You're seeing everything that's going on, and you're, you're working with Jesus, and you're, you're watching this joker, and you're like, no, this, we can't let this happen. And you bring all these guys together, and you say, listen, army of angels, we're going to go there, and we're going to protect Jesus because he's, He's the man, you know, mm. and uh, Jesus is is beat and he starts walking through the streets on the way to get crucified and he locks eyes with Michael and he tells him through that stare, this got to happen. Mm-hmm. So you think about this, you think about your best friend or your wife or your child or you're, if you're a military guy like me, your commander, your sergeant major, 
you're going to go there and you're going to stand there and watch them be executed. Hmm. Think of what's going through their hearts as these angels. So when, when Jesus finally died, they roared. Very powerful. Is it? Yeah, sadness, anger. What is it? You know, frustration. What, yeah, they don't know. They don't know what it is. But mm-hmm. when Jesus died, the world went dark, the earth shook, and what happened in the temple? The curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom. Mm-hmm. That's when that really sunk into me. Because as a Christian, I should have understood that. I should have understood what that meant. I didn't understand what that meant till like a year and a half ago. Mm. The curtain ripped from the top to the bottom because now you don't have to separate those artifacts and this special area from us. Jesus mm. died for our sins. We have direct access. We don't have to, we don't have to go through you know, like I said, we don't have to go through the box of goodies and we don't have mm. to go and kill a bunch of animals uh, that Moses was told to do. We don't have to do that because that's what happened on that day. So, and I'm not trying to, you know, make people out there get all crazy about, oh, this guy's a weirdo. He's thinking, no, you don't, I, I'm telling you a story. You can take mm-hmm. it or leave it, but I'm going to tell it in a way that you're going to be like, whoa. And at the end of it, you're going to be thinking, man. I might need to check in on this Jesus bro and see mm-hmm. what you know see what this guy is all about and that's once again that's that one person we need them to read that story and and uh Yeah and no. some of it's pretty gruesome um there's a guy Benaya who's probably the baddest dude in the Bible he's way okay. badder than King David cuz he was out he was doing the work of King David um and then there's other people that are, are interesting, like Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, who happens to be the great, 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 great grandmother of King David. Mm. And she was a strumpet. Right. See, so my, there, my there's... Rec- I was just going to say my recollection of the, uh, of all of that's not nearly as good as yours. I am um, been a, uh, Grew up going through the Catholic school system and uh, elementary and, and high schools and the rest, but uh, it'll be it'll be very interesting to read your take and those stories on that because that'll uh, uh, there's there's some stories there that I've completely forgotten too. Yeah, and that's the thing we've all read. I mean, I've I've read the Bible from front to rear. I did that to because I'd never done it before, and I read it and I was like, I didn't even I don't remember this story. What is this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like Esther and Mordecai, that's a great story. That's in, in this book. Jael with the tent peg. And Deborah, who was a very strong woman, that all happened at the same time when Deborah and Barak met. And, she, and he's like, I'm not going into battle without you. That doesn't mean mm. she was a warrior. That means that mm. she was somebody that they needed for her, her direct line to God. Mm. So y- you can't, you know, I'm not trying to make something out to be something it's not like i had uh one of the things my wife read it she's like uh no barack would not have touched her and she would not have touched him because Mm -hmm. at that point in the world a a man didn't touch a woman and a woman didn't you know that's how it was or the Mm -hmm. way their hair was done or or any of this kind of stuff and then when you think about um esther and mordecai that this jewish gal gets taken in to be the the wife of king xerxes you know, she goes through the mm. process and she gets selected from hundreds of other virgins to be the, she must have been something special to be selected so. by Xerxes to be, you know, that woman. And then what she ended mm. up doing, it's, you know, she's like the behind the scenes guerrilla warfare lady on the inside while Mordecai is doing his thing. And by the way, if you really want to stump people, the next time you order a Starbucks coffee and they ask you what your name is, just tell them Mordecai. Mordecai. And you will see some crazy spellings of Mordecai. <laughs> well, being very conscious of your time and being a note guy as well, I got all these different things that I'd love to chat about, but. Well, we're, I, let's chat. I, I, I am in no hurry. So you tell me what you want to talk about. Okay. Well, there's a question that, um, you talk about the shadows and you're clearly passionate about making sure that you can help other people. 
um, both in a leadership capacity as well as a um, uh, spiritual and mental well-being. Positivity is a very um, important thing for you, as it is for me. How do you deal with the shadows or what advice would you give somebody else that you have learned through your experiences that they might be able to apply to their own dark thoughts? Oh my goodness. Yep. Looks like it's time for me to go. <laughs> that's a, that's a, yeah. So here's what I want. The, the first thing that I would say is everybody has that. Everybody. I don't care who you are. Everybody, unless you're completely brain dead, you, you, people have things that they have to deal with and how we get through that, everybody handles it differently. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address this maybe a little different than you might expect. I hang around with a lot of law enforcement and military guys. And they have a lot of struggles because of things they did do, didn't do, will do, should have done. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, mm -hmm. I should have done this, should have done that at this point. Or I did this and I did that and that was the wrong decision. Or I did this and I did that, it's right. But I killed somebody or I maimed somebody or I, I, mm -hmm. I should have ran out there and grabbed this guy and saved him. Or I should have, you know, there's a lot of that going on. And as they talk about this, you know, they get together with their buddies and they're, they're, they're going down memory lane give me a, fill up a, give me a shot of liquor here. So they mm -hmm. take that shot of liquor and they, they drink a depressant. Mm. And you think a depressant is going to help you get through a time like that? Like you think alcohol is going to give you some sort of right answer? I, mm. I'm, I'm not going to buy that. Okay. So one of the first things I tell guys is, why are you drinking? If you want to go out, if you can go out and have a beer with your buddies, that's not what I'm talking about. Or you work hard all day and you want to go have a beer or, what, or whatever your drink happens to be. Um, but for me, it's, it's got to be none of that mm. because it's, there's nothing, there's not one thing that I get out of alcohol that is positive in my life. It's not going to make my mm -hmm. wife happy. It's not going to make me a better person. It's not going to make me feel better the next day when I'm on the range. It's not going to make me healthier. Mm -hmm. None of that. So mm -hmm. that's one of the quickest ways I believe to deal with the shadow is not give in and, and drink that. So, so how do you, how do you not drink? Well, it, it, this is going to sound crazy, but just don't do it. You <laughs> want to talk about a, a more impressive person, the person that steps up and says, I'm going to do what everybody else does. Or the person that goes, no, nah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say you don't drink. But I usually just say, no, nah, I'm good. I don't drink. And people are like, whoa, what do you mean you don't drink? It, it's not weird, bro. I don't drink. You don't know huh? if I'm not doing that because I was an alcoholic, if I'm not doing that because of, you don't know. It's none of your business. I don't drink, period. That's mm -hmm. it. So if we can get a young guy or young gal out there that is struggling just to stop that one thing, then that, and I've seen this happen with hundreds of people in both directions, drugs and alcohol and kill themselves, get off yep. drugs and alcohol, and be a vibrant, beautiful human being that's helping people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I haven't mm -hmm. even talked about the religious part of it, because that's, that's something that some guys will say, well, I'm very spiritual. Okay, what does that mean? For me, spiritual is I'm, I get to talk to my best friend who's Jesus, and I can, we can have this discussion. And that's part of it too, because as my buddy says, my buddy, Johnny Dog Cone, he's an old fella from Utah. I grew up, he, he's, I grew up in South Dakota and he was this guy that he's just a character and, and we've become good friends. He really helped my mom when my dad passed away and him and his wife helped him and now his wife passed away. And he told me one day, he said, uh, when his wife was struggling with her, she had had a really bad stroke. He said, uh, yeah, sometimes I got to just stare at a rock and, you know, and sometimes I got to talk to Howard and I'm like, talk to Howard. Who's Howard? And he goes, boy, don't you read the Bible? And I said, yeah, I've read the Bible. And he goes, it says right in the Bible, Howard be thy name. And it, <laughs> it, it, it struck me that here's a guy who at the time was probably 78 years old. Cause he's like 81 or 82 right now. When he struggled 
He didn't call me. He called somebody else and had that conversation. Mm-hmm. So whatever your spirituality is and you want to avoid, avoid that darkness, then you know, be able to do that. The other thing I'm going to say is there's nothing wrong with a little darkness. Yes. I really believe there's not because I believe that in this, let's go back to what Jordan Peterson said. The only people that truly can be good people are those that have the ability to do evil. Mm -hmm. Yet they chose not to do it. They know how to use a sword and they carry it every day, but they they choose to keep it in the sheath. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I have these, I have thoughts and I look at things and how would I attack this and how would I do that? You know, and, and so those are, there's some dark thoughts, but... I'm on the I'm on the side of the good, so at least mm-hmm. currently <laughs> I am. Some other people may <laughs> say that I'm not. Um, and then on the other the other part of it is, um, there was a guy that was my team leader in Somalia, John Hale, and he is one of the greatest leaders I ever worked with, worked for, and I still have the utmost respect for him. And I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole, but I'm just going to say this. John took his own life. Mm -hmm. And that makes me really sad. That doesn't make him less of a man. It doesn't make him less of a great leader. It it shouldn't diminish any of that. He, He felt like he needed to do that to relieve those around him of the struggles he was having. That's, that's how he felt. And I, you know, I've talked to his brothers. His brother was kind of pissed at me, and we had this conversation. He really changed my mind about how I would view what John had done. So, okay, that happens. Well, he was a team leader in Somalia. A couple months ago, another one of our team leaders in Somalia killed himself. And the only other team leader for that troop, he got killed in Somalia. So of all the three team leaders in one of the troops, all three of them are now dead. One because he was killed by the bad guys and on a mortar attack after the 3rd of October and two guys because they took their own lives. So when that happened, I called up another one of the guys who was, and I'm not going to tell you his name, but I called him up because he's was very good friends with the, the last guy that killed himself. And I said, man, just thinking about, you know, and he goes, let me tell you something. If you ever hear that I killed myself, You better call the cops and start an investigation. He goes, because dudes like you and me are not going to do something like that. And when he said that, he gave me ownership like crap. Because I've had some dark thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I can't do that because other people are depending on me. We can't can't do that. If you want to keep leading, keep leading you have dark thoughts. That's fine. Why? Tell me what you're fixing by killing yourself. Tell Mm -hmm. me what you're fixing by doing something. I don't know what it would be. I mean, if you want to go out with a bang, I got better ways for you to do it than to, you know, to, to to hurt yourself. Um, so I guess, I don't know. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's a tricky one, you know. I wrote a I wrote a poem kind of about that. And it it uh it was at a kind of a very rough time I was having. And at that point maybe not at that point. Within 6 months of that, I realized a lot of things that were causing it and I just took those out of my life and the things that were causing it for me were going down memory lane Mm -hmm. i can tell the story in a clinical environment when i get up and do a leadership seminar i'm doing a seminar i'm still very emotionally invested in that seminar but i'm not with the people i was there with and going and listen to this and then alcohol is involved and all that stuff and when i had this bad experience it was right after one of those reunions and we went back to 
Um, we actually went back because some of the guys were getting upgraded uh, some of their awards. We had got upgraded previously. I got upgraded to a Silver Star like six months before that. And then we went back and some guys were getting upgraded to uh, the Distinguished Service Cross. And it just, man, it really, it, it really hit me. And we left before the ceremony even started. I just left. And I, then I was like, why did I leave? I'm a terrible person. It's not like I can go back and redo this because it's never happening again. And I started beating myself up for that. And then finally I'm like, what am I doing? If, it's, if I'm not made a better person by going to that reunion, you know, I'll give you an example. And you, you were never in the military, right? No. Okay, so let's, let's go back to your high school reunion. Let's say that, and I've never been to a high school reunion. So if you went to a high school reunion, why would you go? If you would go because you want to see your friends and have a good time, man, I'd say you should go. If you want to go just to see if you're better than everybody else, you shouldn't go. I agree. If you want to go to make fun of other people, you shouldn't go. If you're going to go there and it's going to bring back memories that were bad, maybe you were that kid that was beat up or who knows, then mm. don't go. Don't, if it's not going to make you a better person, don't be part of that. You know, mm. And that's difficult because a lot of people are pushing us in directions and if you don't need to go, don't go. Don't, don't let anybody tell you to go and hurt yourself. And, I, and I'm not talking about like physically, I'm talking like mentally oh, hurt huge. yourself. Right. I had to realize that too, like with my family, not my immediate family, because my immediate family is five star awesome. But some of my other family, I realized like every time, every time I'm going to talk to them, I have to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. They never reach out to me. And then when I get done, I always feel like I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Man, I feel so much better. I haven't talked to any of those people in years. And I'm the better for it. So that doesn't mean they're bad people because I think they're good people, but we're not good together. So I'm just not going to do it. So that's, Lucas, that's what I, that's my advice. I that's my advice. That a lot. But, oh, and, and I, I'll tell you one more thing. And I've said this in some other podcasts and other, other interviews I've done. If you get up in the morning and you think about somebody other than yourself, you're probably going to have a good day. So what does that mean? You get out of bed and you stretch out a little bit, go for a walk or work to the gym or whatever you do. And then you just think about how can I help somebody else out? And I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about going and doing their trash, you know, dumping their trash. I mean, you could do any of that stuff if you need to do that, but it might be as simple as reaching out to one of your friends and saying, Hey man, I'm just thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Hey man, wanted to see how you're doing everything. How's the family doing? You may not think that's going to help you. I know it's going to help them, but at the end of the day, that's going to also fill your cup up. And if mm -hmm. you'll start thinking about other people and having a mission, you know, I think that military guys suffer because they don't have a mission anymore. They were, they had just as many dark devils living inside their heart before, but they're able to focus on a mission with a group of people and accomplish that mission. Well, what's your mission now? You have a mission. You're all over the map. I mean, bro, you're, you're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Why do I do that? Because if I don't do that, then I get inside my own head again and I start mm -hmm. having, I do bad things when I'm, when I'm not busy, when I'm not focused on a project, whether it's writing a book. Um, and, and I was going to say, one of the things we're about to do, Dirty Civilian, there's some guys that do this podcast and they they invited me to come on and talk about some of the books I've been reading. And the mm -hmm. first stack of books that I'm going to talk about is about Rogers Rangers. And, and that's exciting to me. So now I'm putting my energy into making sure I got all my data correct, or at least I can tell the story and talk about these different books. And then we've, mm -hmm. we've actually put a new thing on our website under podcast. So people can click on that, go there and see this recommended book list, click on the books and immediately go to Amazon to buy the books which, nice. I mean, we're going to get a little tiny portion of that, but you're going to get the book for the same price. If you're going to buy it, just go on there and buy it that way. Totally. We're also doing a section on there for equipment. So this, we literally just started this process a few weeks ago and it's now live. So if you see the podcast thing, you can click on that. It might actually say, um, 
blog beside that now too, but I, I know it says podcast. You click on that, it'll go on there. And man, I'm excited. That's a new thing that I've got to do this next week on Tuesday. I've got to get going. I've got to have my notes and be squared away and <laughs> do this presentation for these guys and and make yourself uncomfortable. If you get uncomfortable, you won't have time to worry about the dark side because you'll be worrying like about that. the light side, you know, just trying to do things and, and get it done. But anyway, so I'll, uh, what's your next question? Well, man, you got some time. If I answered that one good enough. Yeah, you did. You did. And well, the other one was what, what gets you up? What gets you motivated? And it, part of that's got to be all these different projects that you have. Yeah. Every day it's something different. And I'd, I'd say that you, you got to have a mission. So you call it a mm-hmm. project and I call it a mission. Like my mission is mm-hmm. to finish these five daggers I'm working on. And I've got these two integrals I'm working on. I got a couple of tomahawks I'm working on and that's a lot of stuff. But once again, I've, I'm, I used to say I'm a scatological thinker, but then I found out that scatological actually means the study of poop. And that's not exactly what I <laughs> intended for that to mean. So my brain is going in all these different directions. I've got to have a different project or a different mission. So right now my mission is that podcast to get that done next week. Um, the mission after that then is I leave to go shoot a NRL hunter match in Alabama, a mm. long range match. Um, my mission after that is I head to Florida to jump out of planes for a couple of days to get recertified so that I can go jump into Normandy, France in June. So that, so Very you cool. see, I have a lot of things that are going on. And if you would have said, go right before Thanksgiving, what are you focusing on? Well, I'm focusing on setting up blinds so when my grandson comes here, right. we can hunt deer together. And my wife is right there with me. We're setting up game cameras and trying to figure out where these deer are at. And then Thanksgiving rolls in and he kills this awesome buck. I mean, it, that mm. was my mission. Like, we got to get this dude to kill. I never thought he'd kill a buck. I thought he'd kill a doe. So we were, he kills this buck and we go find it. Ran like 50 yards. And he goes, Grandpa, we got to cut his head off. And I'm like, Denver, we're going <laughs> to harvest the meat. And, but, you know, I'm like, he goes, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know all that, but we got to cut his head off because I got to hang this head on the wall. And I went, <laughs> we, we never talked about that. My wife and I were like, this is crazy. We never talked about it because we always thought he'd shoot a doe. Well, mm-hmm. now he shot a buck. He still wants the meat. He still wants all mm-hmm. that and be respectful sure. of the animal. But he looks in my office and he sees all these animals hanging on the wall and he's like, I kind of like grandpa's office. I want one of those hanging in my, in my room. So we got, you know, I'm getting the, the, uh, European done there so he can have that and keep that for the rest of his life. Cause I mean, very cool. everybody I've ever talked to, everybody remembers the first deer they killed. They may not even remember the fifth or the 10th or the 20th, but that first deer, it's important. They're going to remember. So that gun now it's his, that AR 15 that he killed that deer with, that's going to be his. So for me, that's what gets I, me up every day. Something different. And I like that, you know, for me having, like you say, a mission, a project, something that I'm working towards the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. What, what do I think is worthy? But there's also a cycle that I find, okay, I get to a certain point in something I've got it. I've got it understood. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Um, are you able to stop and just not require that next mission? Are you able to, in like, cause I, I'm positive that you are appreciative for everything you have and you're appreciative for, for where you're at, but it comes back to like, there's a saying Rockefeller, he was talked to by a reporter. It's like, man, you got so much money. How much do you need? And he's like, oh, just $1 more. Right. For him, that was the process. That was what he lived for. Is there a common theme or trend to all of your missions that you have that lead to an overarching, um, I guess, North star that would see you constantly moving towards something without having the feeling of, okay, I've done it now. What? Yeah, I don't, I don't. So first of all, I don't have any bucket lists. Hmm. I don't have a bucket list cause I've done everything I've ever wanted to do. And I never mm-hmm. had a bucket list to begin with because I just said, oh, either I said it or my wife said it. My wife said, why don't you try this special forces thing? Well, I don't know if I can do it. And she goes, well, you never know until you try. So mm-hmm. I did it. Well, then I went to the unit and then I did this and then I did that. Well, I just, no, I'm completely, I, here, let me ask you this question. Maybe this will answer mm-hmm. it better for you. My brother-in-law got cancer 
and for he had the, it was his third time on cancer, and they they told me he had six months to live. He ended up living like two years, but he still passed away. So my wife and I were sitting here one day, and I said, "Man, can you imagine? You're given six months to live. Mm-hmm. I mean, what would you do? And I'm asking you this question: mm-hmm. What would you do if you had six months left to live?" Are we going to go to the dark side? Well, I, I just want you to think about it. I want the people out there to think like, what would you do? You know what my wife said? Mm. She said, I'm already doing it. Yeah. And you know what I said to myself? I said, I'm not doing it. That's the, that. Him dying changed my life. Because you should live every day like you got six months left to live. If I die tomorrow, I'm completely happy. You probably are too, but why do we, why, I don't know. If you go around every day thinking you're scared of dying, and actually this is, my son asked me this one time. We were, we had, we were out at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I just got called back to the unit and we're going and we had a hot tub out back of our, we lived on this river and we'd get up in the morning and hit that hot tub and then we would, or we hit the river, hit the hot tub and then we were plunging before plunging was cool, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, he goes, dad, aren't you afraid of dying? Cause I was going to go back and go right to Iraq and be a troop sergeant major and lead guys in combat. He goes, aren't you afraid of dying? And I, I looked at him and I didn't even think about it. I said, no, I'm afraid of not living. Mm -hmm. So no, I got, I, I, I changed I've changed my complete thought process and that's what I think everybody should do. I don't care what your age is. If you had six months to live, what would you do? Does that mean you would just blow all your money? Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is like, what, what would you, who would you want to spend the last six months of your life with? Mm -hmm. Then you better daggum do that right now. You know what I'm saying? Such an easy question for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's family. I mean, my, yeah, my family. That's that's it. There's there's Wife there's a few kids. people I want to be with too. But my 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 focus would be my wife, my grandkids, and then my children. Mm. And, and if you don't have grandkids, you may not understand that. But grandkids are a special <laughs> they're a special thing. So that's the that's the thing that really changed my outlook on. I don't know, I even know how we got on that question, but that that's been. Man, that's been a, a a big thing to me. Yeah. Cause I don't know what I was living for before. I mean, I was thinking maybe it was the money or maybe it was the fame or the I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's no what am I trying to do? Well, I just now it's it's simple. I want to spend more time with my wife, and I'm doing that. We're traveling more together, we're doing stuff. Um, I've backed off on my training schedule. Now there's certain things, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have enough money in the bank to pay your bills, then you better dig them, get out there and work hard. But when you're done working, go home to your family, go home to the people mm-hmm. that love you and are there supporting you every day. You know, and that's the other thing too. Uh, uh, one thing I really come to me one day, I was asked to speak in a church and I was like, man, I don't know about this. I'm gonna get struck by lightning. And as I was speaking, something come to me and I said, what, my son is an awesome dude. Why would I treat my son less better than I would a complete stranger on the street. Right. You better pull your head out of your butt and that's your son, that's your daughter, that's your wife, that's your kids, your grand, whoever, that's your mom, your dad, or whoever. If you do not put them on a pedestal, there's something wrong with you because that person on the street could could care less. Of, they might like you right now, but once, like I said before, if you mm-hmm. do something bad, they're going to completely throw you under the bus. Whereas your family is going to stick with you through thick and through thin. So, yeah, your kids, you want them to be the best, but treat them with respect and and ad- admiration, and they're going to return the favor. And you know, when you're, I'm 56 years old. And I can tell you, without a shadow of a doubt, both my children love me. So if you can say that, 
and I can obviously I say that back to them. If you mm-hmm. can say that, then you're then you're doing the right thing. If 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 there's a question, then you better get it right, because they're more important than any person you're going to meet on the street. I don't mm-hmm. care how imper- important that person is. So, familiarity will breed complacency, and people will become yep. close and familiar with their family, and they're like, "Oh, they'll be here tomorrow." And you know, there's a reason why my children have never seen some of my family members, right? There's, um, like you say, oh, and a past podcast guest, he says, you know, sometimes it's time to just pull the weeds. Is it bringing you positivity <laughs> into your life? Right. Yep. And then we use, um, every day we remind ourselves the most important thing, most important resource that we have is our time. The only thing that makes that important is death. That's what gives life value because now you have a finite amount of it. How are we spending that time? And it's that level of being present for those that you care about is I think the biggest gift that you can give yourself and that you can give them. So I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with what you're saying there. I, I have a question too. I was thinking about that. You said something there and I want to, I wanted to ask this when you said it before, but I want to ask it now. Mm. Early, earlier you made that statement on leadership that you memorized. Mm. Sure. Where, where was that from? Cadets. I was in a army cadet program here in, in Canada okay. and it did, did a lot for me. Um, I was going down a path that, um, wasn't positive. There's a reason why I got kicked out of a number of schools and it was, I was going in a direction that, uh, was just going to end up in jail probably in the long term. not because I was doing uh, bad things, but I was, uh, oppositional in my thinking. Uh, I didn't yeah. fit in with the, um, uh, the established structure and the, the school system. And you got into the army cadet program and a lot of those traits were, um, were looked upon fondly, right? Not, not necessarily being oppositional, but being able to think outside of, find creative solutions in order to, uh, to get the job done. So, um, uh, gave me a sense of community and purpose and structure that, uh, I think was uh, very important. Yeah. And that's what I found was when I joined the military, I found my tribe. Right. And you know, some people say we all have to get along. I, I, I couldn't disagree with that more. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have to all get along. I think what we have to do is we have to be with the people that are part of our tribe that has nothing to do with what country you're from. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin or, or your religion or anything like that. It has to do Mm. with being part of that tribe. And if people don't understand my tribe, they're not part of my tribe because I'm going to meet a guy that's a Muslim and he's going to become one of my best friends. And I, and, and and he's going to change my heart because I used to hate all Muslims. And now I, Mm. I don't because of that one dude, or I'm going to meet a guy that's, um, a Canadian guy, JTF two guy or whatever. And we're going to become mm. very good friends because we we're from the same tribe and we, mm-hmm. we sound different. We look different, you know, but we're absolutely from the same tribe and you never know where you're going to meet those people. And then the other thing, in order to meet those people from the same tribe, you kind of got to tell people what your tribe is. Otherwise yes. they don't know. So yeah. a lot of times if I say something and I get the, the weird look, I'm like, I know you're not part of my tribe and there's no reason that we need to carry on any conversation because mm-hmm. I'm not trying to win you over. You're either mm-hmm. with me or against me. There's no gray area. Mm-hmm. So either you're on the team or you're off the team. And if you're off the team, I'll, I, you're, I'm done with you. Yeah. So you don't have to be a part of it. My thought process, yeah, my life. The only, probably the only people that I would say that doesn't apply to his kids. I mean, all kids are on the team until they get kicked off, you know, <laughs> and, and they're going to, sure. they're going to make that choice. But when you see a little kid, a little kid is, you, you know, we've got to take care of them. And I think that's one of the struggles that a lot of us are having right now is we're seeing our children, you know, the biggest failure we have in America, and I don't know about Canada, but in America, the biggest failure is the family. So the fathers are not being fathers. And if the fathers would step up and be dads, all the mm-hmm. trouble that we have from the bottom to the top would go away because we would take care of our families. We wouldn't mm-hmm. look for welfare. We wouldn't look for any of the state to do that. The church mm-hmm. and the family would do that. 
the dad would stay present with his kids. The kids would then not yes. go to be delinquents because their dad would be there to to discipline them and to praise them and to make them a better a better human being. And then they would go on to have families and do the same thing. Yet now what we're seeing is we're saying that dad's a mom and mom's a dad and this guy's the mm. dude and then he's a mother. And then it's like these kids are completely confused. And then we're saying it's more stressful for a lady to have to leave her state to go get an abortion in another state. It's like that poor lady, the struggle she had to murder her child I feel so bad that she had to struggle to drive four hours out of her state to murder her baby. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, are mm -hmm. you serious? This is, the family's gone. And if we don't get that back, and I, I don't, I, I think it's going to take, take something way more significant. I know you're, Canada, you guys had the truckers. You know, the truckers are doing a thing down here now. I heard something so they about did that. What is that about? Well, they're going to do something in Texas and, and they're all getting together. And I think that, uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Cause up there with, uh, um, what's your president's name? Uh, Hitler Trudeau there. Or, yeah. Hitler, Hitler. yeah he, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I yeah. mean, he, he, what he did was criminal first of all, but it was like, it, it, if Canadians don't just stand up and say enough of this crap, well, in mm -hmm. America, if we're not doing that either, we deserve exactly what we get. But if these right. if these guys all go to Texas and they stop this illegal border stuff going on, we could quite possibly see the civil war that people have talked about. I mean, I don't, you know, I was going to lie to you there for a minute. I was going to say, I don't want to see that. But part of me would like to see, let's get this sorted out a little bit here because you're saying it's it's okay for illegals come on we want mm -hmm. immigrants to come in our country all the time we want that we don't totally. want people to do it illegally right and there's a process for it yeah my grandpa and grandma on both sides they were immigrants so i'm the second gen generation american i'm really glad that they immigrated here and i'm glad they did it legally mm -hmm. so i don't know anyway you break you break down that value structure and you don't uphold it and people who would otherwise uphold a value structure say, well, why are we doing this? The breakdown of the family unit, the breakdown of the value structures. And I don't think it's, um, you know, you, you look at social media and regular media and what people are being fed on a daily basis, you can see a very drastic change in the way that people think. And interestingly enough too, though, uh, as that pendulum swings further and further away, it's going to reach a point where it starts causing people to shake their heads. The amount of people like yourself, they're talking about faith and religion and uh, their value systems, uh, whether it's faith-based or not, um, is, is happening a heck of a lot more now than it was 10 years ago. And I think it's because people are seeing the need to have a shared value system that we can all sing yeah. off of the same song sheet. That's where the military is fantastic. And that's where I think mandatory conscription is a fantastic thing. Everyone has had at least a shared adversity and they've got a shared experience and some pride in what they do. And they're working together off of the same song sheet. You dilute that too much and you're going to run into the inevitable plot problems that we're seeing right now. Yeah. So I walk into a supermarket and we've got conscription or mm. whatever you want to call it, mandatory service or whatever. Sure. Um, conscription's kind of a rough word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, it really is. Yeah. But so we have mandatory service and that doesn't mean sure. that you got to be in the army. It doesn't mean that it means that you have to, to serve your country for two years or whatever. So I walk Fantastic. into local supermarket and I see a guy there and I walk up to him and I don't care what color he is and I don't care what language he speaks. He's in America. And I say, who'd you serve with? Mm -hmm. Immediately we have a bond. Because 100%. both of us served our country. And if, if we had mandatory service, we would, uh, we would have that bond with each other. Like you just said, because now when I see guys that are military, I mean, I immediately have a bond with him. I had a guy that I met this kid and he said, uh, he goes, I'm a veteran or his mom said he's a veteran. I was like, Oh, you're a veteran. Where'd you serve? What outfit were you with? 
and he was a Marine. And I was like, oh yeah, cool. So I start talking to him and I end up listening to him talk for 10, 15 minutes, you know, and, we're, and he's telling me all kinds of stories and everything's going great, you know, and his mom's over there and she's kind of getting teary eyed and uh, get done talking. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I go off to my thing and the mom says, excuse me, sir. I was like, yeah, she goes, I've never seen my son. He's never talked to my husband or me about any of that stuff. Mm. And I said, why? I said, why should he? Mm-hmm. I'm a veteran. He's a veteran. We're the same. So he's speaking to me. We're that's it. Don't don't. It's yep. not bad. It's just mm-hmm. fine. He's a, there's there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to go talk about hunting or fishing to somebody <laughs> that doesn't hunt or fish unless I'm right. trying to convince them they should or you know they should sure hunt or fish. You know I want to try to attract people to do that. I want to try to attract people to build knives and to do. I don't care what you do. Make something. You know make something mm. that's other than a meme. I mean something make, worthwhile. Make, yeah, make something out of wood with your hands, or I, I don't care what it is, you know. So that's fantastic. Well, why don't we look at wrapping it up here? There's, like I say, we could probably go on talking all day. You've imparted a heck of a lot of value to me. I trust to the audience as well. Kyle, thank you so much for being on the Silver Core podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been. And I'm not just saying this, this has been one of the best podcasts I've been on in a while because we didn't just focus on 1993 or, you know, Iraq Mm -hmm. or whatever. We got to talk about the stuff that really matters because that other stuff is just, that's just a job. It was an adventure, a job or whatever, but man, life is about all these other really important things that we talked about and, and. I'm glad you're on the same sheet of music with me. You never looked at me like, man, this guy is from outer space, you know? No, nope, not once. So, uh, yeah, find your tribe, dude. You know, might be a, some crazy Canuck up there. It might be a, a <laughs> Muslim a guy from Egypt. Yeah, yeah, I met this guy from Egypt on the shooting range. I, I didn't know he was from Egypt. I thought he was a Mexican. And I'm like, oh, he's Egyptian. Well, I speak colloquial Egyptian Arabic. So I started rapping Arabic, and he's like, you speak... <laughs> very good Egyptian Arabic. And now he and I are very, very good friends and he has changed my heart. So open up, open up to those people that are part of your tribe and and let them come in and man, it's going to be amazing. And then get up tomorrow and do something for somebody else. And it's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Last thing I'm going to say, God bless Canada and God bless America. I love the message. Thank you. Thank you.